How you doing? So, uh, I'm Big Easy. I'm part of DC 217, and we're putting together the Ethics Village. And when we were doing the CFP, it was my privilege to read the CFP of this man, Enno Ray, who happens to be, uh, he has a conference in Germany, and I did my first public talk at his conference in Germany uh, over a decade ago. So it's my privilege to introduce Enno Ray from Troopers in Germany. And um, the circle's now complete, Enno, because Enno is a first-time DEF CON attendee, and this is his first DEF CON talk. And we chose him to do the keynote to kick off the village. So thank you for coming, Enno, very much. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you for the warm words. Um, actually, it's not only my first DEF CON talk, it's my first talk on ethics at all. So I'm a bit, uh, so to say, nervous. But happy to see you, uh, so many of you. Uh, just a quick intro who I am. Um, I have been in InfoSec in different roles since 97. I have a technical background, um, which means uh, I'm from large scale networking from carrier space. I've given a number of technical talks, so it's, uh, that's my domain, usually. And one thing that could be of relevance for my talk today is that uh, I run a company since many years, and within that company we have an ethics committee, which I installed, and I will later lay out uh, why I did that. And uh, this is one part, uh, or this part of one of the case studies. Uh, the, say the purpose, of today's talk is, say, threefold. Uh, that is to make clear that one's, say, ethical questions, ethical, um, I use uh, the, uh, the European um, plural of uh, dilemma, which is dilemmata. Uh, so once uh, dilemmata occur, how to handle those? So to understand there are different ways um, on a maybe structural level to tackle them. Uh, then uh, to, like, provide a I wouldn't say a guideline, but maybe some questions to ask uh, once you face a dilemma, which, say, uh, steps of ref reflection to go through, uh, and uh, then to make clear uh, all this is not easy. It's not just, uh, this is not about, as uh, Richard already laid out uh, 15 minutes ago, uh, taking easy decisions. That is, uh, so there's, uh, that is the main, the main intent here to educate you a bit, but uh, also to make you uh, think uh, in, a, in a certain, in a critical way about dilemma, uh, dilemma that you might face. Uh, so where is ethics relevant for InfoSec practitioners? Pretty much everywhere. Uh, there is spaces uh, which uh, are going to be discussed later on in more detail, vulnerability disclosure, exploit sales, uh, there is some debate already going on. But other than that, whenever there is an intersection between InfoSec and humans, ethical questions might come into play. Again, uh, I will have a number of case studies later on where this becomes uh, more clear. Uh, some disclaimers in advance. I don't have a formal education on ethics. Uh, actually, I have a formal education in, in literature, uh, which you will see later on in my slides uh, somewhat. but. Uh, uh, and uh, during my studies in the 90s, um, I worked with computers and I worked with networks. So this is how I got into this, but um, from a formal perspective, uh, uh, French and German. Uh, literature is my background. Uh, second disclaimer, ethics is not something uh, which you should discuss on Twitter. I, I, I tried. That's a, uh, and uh, that's not the right format, uh, actually, for the type of uh, questions we are going to discuss today. And the last one, um, uh, there, is a, there is a guy uh, who I'd like to mention here, Ben Sevenbergen. Uh, I owe him a lot of uh, the things uh, I, I talk about today. He's at Princeton uh, at the moment, so if you want to look up his work, and, uh, that would be, uh, say, um, going further than uh, what I do here in, in, in this talk. From a, say, definition perspective, what is ethics, or what is actually the, the part of ethics that I'm going to tackle that is practical ethics? Uh, this is a 
say a formal definition, which I took from uh, from the work of uh, of Ben, uh, which he started at the Oxford Internet <coughs> Institute. The task of practical ethics is to identify moral problems. So it's about problems. It's about uh, dilemmata. Uh, to clarify, and then to clarify, uh, say um, what is uh, what are the values affected. Um, what uh, to reflect on how possible actions uh, could look like. Disclose a vulnerability, uh, refrain from disclosing, disclose it via certain channels. Identify the, uh, the causes of action and then uh, choose one which ideally uh, reflects best, say, the, the values and the decisions um, you took earlier on. So in short, it's about uh, doing the right thing based on uh, a certain type of reasoning. And um, again, uh, it's about dilemmata. If it was about easy situations, uh, if the things that we are going to discuss today or which are uh, being discussed in, in ethics in general could be solved easily, uh, then it, uh, we wouldn't, all, uh, wouldn't need this uh, ethics domain. Uh, it would be sufficient to have laws or to have stuff like Ten Commandments. Uh, if that would be uh, sufficient to steer human life and uh, decision-taking, uh, uh, then I could stop here. Uh, but it's about dilemmata, and dilemmata means uh, it's not easy. Uh, this is, uh, I'm, I'm very keen on stressing this many times in, in the talk. Uh, this is not about the easy path and taking easy decisions, as you will see uh, later on in the case studies. Uh, from a formal perspective, uh, just to give you an idea of how to tackle, uh, say, certain types of questions, I will lay, uh, very quickly lay out three uh, principles, uh, three approaches of the uh, of the uh, within the ethics world, which is a you know, which is a huge one. There is many schools of thoughts. There is many approaches. There is uh, different frameworks. Uh, there is different uh, types of terminology. Uh, I'm going just to tackle very quickly uh, three of those. Uh, as those uh, might be important for the, uh, for the discussion later on. Uh, the first one is uh, so-called uh, consequentialism. Uh, there is one flavor of that, which is utilitarianism. Uh, in short, it's about, say, uh, the end justify the means. Uh, so um, uh, the, uh, the approach of a consequentialist would be, okay, here's some possible actions that I could take, paths of action. Let me identify what has the highest benefit, whatever this benefit might be, or this benefit, how this benefit could be uh, identified, and then choose the path that provides uh, uh, the highest benefit. Uh, that could be one possible approach. Uh, the, the, the problem with uh, consequentialism is, uh, in the end of the day, you can justify all types of actions with that. You can come up with, oh, I have to like uh, torture people, or I have to shoot down a plane because in the end of the day this is uh, better for everybody or uh, taking um, things into account. Uh, doing this um, uh, has overall for society a, a higher benefit than another course of action. Uh, that is actually the main problem with this one. Let me already state that in the technical domain, which uh, has a high, uh, highly represented at DEF CON, uh, there is always a temptation for, uh, uh, say, consequentialist uh, line of reasoning. Uh, we are used to, uh, to solve problems, to tackle problems, <laughs> and to, uh, to rate problems by the, uh, by, the, uh, by the result. And a consequentialist, a utilitarist, tackles things from a result perspective. Uh, to illustrate a problem of consequentialism in a nutshell, uh, say, if in the 15th century uh, South America, it hasn't rained for a, a number of weeks, uh, a possible cause of action was, well, we should uh, come up with a sacrifice. Um, because that's uh, good for everybody when it rains, okay, um, maybe one or two uh, uh, young um, persons might not agree with that statement, but, uh, well... Uh, this is a very consequentialist uh, line of reasoning. Uh, then there is a completely different line of um, thought, school of thought, that is called uh, deontology. Uh, deontology usually works on the basis of very strict rules, like do not torture, period. That would be a deontologist um, uh, approach to a specific question. 
The problem here is this might actually lead to uh, situations uh, which can, uh, can have very bad uh, consequences. Uh, say you followed, um, uh, had a deontologist um, approach of do not lie. And in uh, World War II Germany, uh, you, you hit some people in your, in, your, in your house and the Gestapo turns up and asks you, okay, is there anybody hidden in your house? Uh, and you follow that do not lie approach uh, that could have very bad consequences. So there is some um, problems with this one as well, but uh, those two are, the, say, from a certain perspective, the main uh, antagonists. And then there is one um, which is, has gained quite some ground in the, in the last, uh, say, decade, especially in the information technology domain, which is called principalism. Uh, which tries to identify, okay, what are, say, common values uh, to, uh, for society or for groups of people, and then uh, walk along uh, those values. And uh, say there is a, a, a well-known flavor of um, principalism, works around, okay, there is a, a value autonomy, then we should take into account when discussing ethical questions uh, what's the actual benefit for, of causes for of actions? Uh, let's talk about do not cause harm, do not be evil, would, uh, would be a typical uh, a principalist approach. And justice, like when uh, be, be fair in weighing options. Uh, there is, a, 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 say, in the information, I have to use a thing that I'm not used to use, um, but okay, I'm, I'm working uh, with this. Uh, in the information, in the IT uh, domain, there is a um, well-known, uh, say, document, the so-called Menlo Report, uh, guiding principles for um, uh, information and communication, uh, or research in the information and communication domain, authored by uh, Dave Dittrich and, and another guy. And looking at the uh, table of content, you already get an idea uh, what uh, this, say, ethical framework is about. So uh, respect persons, uh, get their informed consent, uh, try to identify who benefits from, a, uh, from an action, balance this with possible risks, and uh, in the end of the day, uh, try to be fair uh, when uh, looking at the options. This is uh, um, an IT flavor of uh, principalism. So now, once we want to do this a bit more in real life. In general, it's a good approach, and this is one that I want to, to lay out to you. To, uh, once you face a dilemma, very simple, said, okay, try to understand the dilemma, try to write it down, try to identify what, uh, what actual, once you have a feeling, well, this doesn't feel right, and I should, maybe shouldn't do this, or you scratch your head, well, okay, we, um, in general, I, I, well, maybe I, we, we should perform it vulnerability disclosure, but in this case, well, maybe it might not be the right cause of auction. Try to write it down, get the facts. Uh, again, uh, this will be, uh, I have some case studies, this will be very important later on. Uh, try to identify who's involved um, and uh, what are the stakeholders of a decision and uh, what are the values affected. Uh, then uh, evaluate, and this is often overlooked, evaluate alternative options. Evaluate, okay, what if I didn't do this? Or w were there any other approaches uh, to get the same, um, to gain the same insight? Uh, say in the, once you perform research projects uh, involving uh, stuff like uh, pot scanning or so, uh, is there any other ways to find out uh, a specific thing uh, you're interested in? Many people don't do that, actually. And uh, the last one, I will skip this for a second. Oh, no, I, I will not uh, skip the last one, um, uh, this one of those. Uh, uh, from my perspective, my experience, very good approach to when you go through options. Like, I could uh, act like this, or I could do another thing, uh, is to ask yourself, if I did the following, would it reflect me as, uh, as a person I would like to be? Uh, I mean, you could say, uh, can I still look into the mirror? 
but uh, this is a bit, a bit more formal approach. My personal value system is an action which I perform aligned with my personal value system. Obviously, you have a feeling for that uh, already when you come up with, well, this doesn't feel right. But still, uh, in the end of the day, ask yourself, is this consistent? Uh, to what degree is this consistent with uh, how I want to be and I want to act and maybe even act as a sample, um, act as a leader? And of course, evaluate in hindsight. Again, this uh, very often doesn't happen. Um, so this is a bit uh, the very generic thing how to tackle an ethical dile uh, uh, dilemma. The facts, the stakeholders, the values, the causes of action, choose one and uh, reiterate at some point of time. There are some uh, additional things before we get into the actual case studies I would like to, uh, to provide as, a, as an advice. Be aware there in, that in many questions, in many, say, situations, there might be a, a, a power imbalance or a knowledge imbalance, especially when people like from a technical domain decide on, well, I should do the following because that's good for everybody. How do you know it's good for everybody? How do you know that uh, everybody else is sharing your perspective that you maybe as a, as a person from the Silicon Valley um, has? So um, you might know more or you might be in a uh, more privileged position than others you perceivingly uh, speak for. Try to keep this in mind. Try to ask yourself in a specific situation, is there a knowledge or power imbalance? Uh, the, sixth one, oh, the, the next one. Uh, keep in mind that the internet is a, a say, social technical system which was designed uh, by a specific, uh, or many uh, parts of the internet were designed by a specific uh, group uh, of people, and so things happening in the internet might reflect uh, certain understandings and certain uh, value systems. Try to keep this one in mind. Uh, maybe try to avoid, uh, or always keep in mind, your cause of action might act as a sample uh, for the better or for the worse, for others. There is a common, uh, there is a very well-known uh, ethical, say, dilemma, the so-called Kana botnet. Uh, some of you might know this, um, where um, I think it's in, in Ethereum, it's like eight years ago. A botnet was created to map the internet. And the guys who did this were actually arguing, like, oh, this is good for everybody, you have an, an, a map of the internet. Uh, and they, uh, well, they compromised systems for that. Which, Maybe you can, can come up with, uh, in, in an ethical reasoning uh, perspective, uh, is the proper cause of action. Uh, maybe not. The thing just is, this uh, might set a precedent. And keep this in mind. Uh, I have been, um, uh, just to give a very quick example here, um, it's, uh, as, as I mentioned, I've, I've given a number of talks in, in, in many conferences. Uh, so uh, I uh, attend conferences as well, uh, not just DEFCON until today, because my daughter's birthday is in, in early August, this is one of the reasons. But uh, at CCC, I was uh, once in a, uh, in, a, in a talk where a guy discussed uh, how to compromise like the, airport, uh, the airline codes, like, uh, and he was uh, making fun of people, well, all those guys are so dumb. Uh, to put their, their tickets on Instagram, and once you get, the, uh, you get a code, you could log in or you could use their mics, whatever. Uh, I'm not a big fan of, uh, say, this type of uh, making fun of people anyway, but uh, there are different uh, styles of speakers, and you might find mine dry, for example. But um, uh, the thing is, in, in that talk, my, my uh, at the time, 13-year-old son was sitting next to me, and the first thing he did when getting back to the hotel room was like uh, going to Instagram, looking at the airport tickets and, hey, the guy on stage did this. So I'm, I can do this too. Well, you, you get the idea. Uh, think about uh, if uh, a course of action that you uh, jump into could uh, be a precedent in one way or another for uh, somebody else. And uh, this was mentioned uh, during the um, uh, Ask Your Friend session as well. Uh, I suggest to be very careful with uh, analogies between the physical and the digital world. Like, well, if we do this, this is like uh, breaking into somebody's house. Or the, um, my experience is very often 
uh, analogies that do not really help or apply. Be careful with that one. Last thing, be honest with your agenda. Obviously, we are all humans, and it's perfectly valid to have an agenda. But, uh, well, put it into the equation. Once it's about uh, gaining, uh, gaining uh, say, fame as a speaker or getting money, that's, uh, all these might be legitimate uh, reasons and objectives of uh, human action. But uh, be honest and uh, put it on the table. Um, very often, uh, say, in the, in the uh, academic uh, internet research world, for many years it has been very popular to, to write papers based on numbers. Like, uh, we scanned the internet for um, uh, IPv6 or uh, open ports on that specific protocol, and then we performed some, some action to find, out, to, uh, to find out which version of a protocol is used. Uh, and this is a good contribution to scientific research. If you look closer, it turns out, I mean, the, the academic world, um, uh, they have their own incentives and their own ways, uh, like, um, publications and being cited and, and uh, quotations and all this. Uh, that's just a specific ecosystem. When you look closer, many of the things that have been, uh, have been done there uh, might not have been necessary. Uh, it, there might have been other ways of uh, gaining the same type of information. It was just, well, it's, uh, it, in many years it was uh, a bit on walk uh, to write papers of that specific type, so everybody did it. Oh, I, I scanned the internet and I was entitled to do so as I'm a scientific researcher. Uh, and uh, obviously it helps to, once you face a, a dilemma, to discuss it with somebody who's not of your domain, is not of the technical domain. Uh, actually, in my case, um, uh, uh, I'm not an overly, uh, say, a religious person, but in, uh, I live in a small town and there is a, uh, there's a, how do you say, a preacher, I think? Uh, a, guy, a guy from the church who has an official uh, position in the church. He's, uh, he's 80. I very much respect him. And it already happened several times when I had a dilemma. Uh, I just went to visit him and to discuss it with him uh, as he has a, a very different and experienced perspective on the world. So that's it from the theoretical part. Now let's uh, get a bit into uh, uh, the meat, uh, the case studies, with one last warning before. Ethical dilemmata, to get through those, is not an easy task. If you have an answer, like you, the, you face a problem and you have an answer after five minutes, uh, you might have been doing it wrong. You might have not have all the facts. Uh, you might have not considered, uh, say, the values and the stakeholders are affected, or you might not have, uh, say, um, been, uh, been self-aware of your agenda. Case studies. Uh, all the case studies I'm going to discuss have, or uh, mostly, they have happened in real life in our organization. So um, uh, I've been facing those in, uh, at some, some point in, in, in life. Uh, let's start with the first one. Um, the organization which I, which I founded and which I, well, then to, to some degree, obviously, represent here, we do a lot of vulnerability research. Uh, both in customer engagements and uh, uh, in, uh, like as part of our uh, company uh, DNA. And uh, there was a situation where we have identified vulnerabilities in an alarm system, in a type of alarm system which was is, uh, sold in Germany in uh, electronic shops like uh, in the US that would be um, uh, Best Buy or a Radio Shack. It doesn't exist any longer, isn't it? But um, in, in these types of stores, you can get an alarm system uh, for your house or for your property. And we found out uh, for a, uh, a commonly sold model, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't exactly rocket science with, um, uh, with uh, software-defined radio uh, to actually uh, correct the codes of communication. Uh, which... At the first glance, it um, doesn't seem so uh, problematic from an ethical perspective, but if you think closer about this, would you disclose this? We have at, um, at e in general, we follow a mostly very conservative and uh, since 10 years, uh, what at the time was called responsible disclosure, 
Uh, I'm happy to see the, ta the term back. Um, there was a whole debate if the term responsible is uh, appropriate or not, but I'm not going to stick into this. Uh, the idea is uh, like have a defined time frame, inform a window, uh, and after a specific time frame, you disclose the things and you hope for that the window has um, fixed the problem in the interim, a patch is available and this patch can, can be rolled out. The thing is, uh, this um, disclosure approach might not work in this specific case very well. Getting the facts, as I laid out at the first step, that's not too difficult in this case. Uh, we know the model, we, we could identify, okay, we, who are the stakeholders affected? Well, anybody using this? Uh, uh, who else is involved? Well, there's, uh, okay, there's a user's perspective, there's a vendor's perspective. It wasn't really possible to identify the vendor as this was kind of OEM uh, stuff. Uh, sold uh, again in, uh, in popular electronic uh, stores. But um, uh, the facts that were easy, the values like, um, uh, okay, it's, uh, the, the harm versus benefit uh, equation, and who is affected, this one becomes very interesting very quickly as looking from a traditional disclosure perspective, there are some assumptions in this uh, disclosure process, which are vulnerabilities is close to the window. The window produces a patch. The patch can be rolled out. And actually, the, the, the people affected by the patch know that the patch is available. And they can actually apply the patch. That's the basic idea behind this, uh, like since 15 years uh, when uh, Rainforest Puppy wrote down the, the first policy laying out the responsible disclosure idea. There are some assumptions in that. When they can be identified, when the producer will produce a patch, affected users get to hold of that and can apply it. And many of those assumptions, if not all, uh, which I mentioned, do not apply here. We couldn't really identify the window. Uh, some, well, in, in Southeast Asia, in, in some country, uh, stuff was produced and it was sold with different labels on it uh, throughout Europe. So how to identify the vendor? We didn't even, f we couldn't really find out if it still existed. Well, the, the stuff was sold, so it was manufactured somewhere, but uh, that was uh, already difficult. But um, even if there was a patch, how would the users know the patch uh, was available? Uh, and uh, even if they knew, like there was a public broadcasting, oh, the following type of systems has a problem, uh, please uh, show up in your electronics store. Uh, if you are affected, uh, they will provide you an, an, an upgrade. How would that upgrade be, uh, be on the system? So uh, res traditional disclosure would have not worked here. And what made the thing um, uh, very interesting was the like harm and benefit equation as uh, this affects, well, uh, people's property. So um, even if we had, say, performed, um, and, and we haven't, as you will see in a second, but uh, if, if we had performed traditional uh, disclosure and after like 90 or maybe prolong that a bit, uh, make it 180 days, uh, publish the thing, uh, what if, uh, say, uh, some people would have not known that, not a, uh, have applied a patch, and into their property was, was broken into, there would be harm caused, real harm in a real world. Uh, that is one thing, and maybe they, they would have showed up in, uh, before our, uh, in front of our company building with the fox, like, since you guys published this, uh, you have helped the bad guys to break into my house. So um, the stakeholders and the values affected, uh, this makes this uh, a very interesting and, and kind of complicated case. Um, uh, I will skip this. Uh, uh, so you might ask, uh, what did we do? The thing is, we try to identify by some channels and some ways uh, the window. Um, this didn't easily work out. We refrained from publishing the thing. We had a free series blog post on like, okay, how to, how to analyze uh, wireless protocols with SDR. And then here is, uh, uh, say, a case study. But it was planned to have a third one on like, okay, the, the case study revealed the following. And we never published that one. Um, it uh, remained a draft in the, in the, in the, in the blog for, for a while and then it was removed. Uh, in a nutshell, we did nothing. Which, from a hindsight perspective, that's highly unsatisfactory. 
Um, what we should have done, but this is like five years ago, um, we should have gone through a, uh, through a third. Nowadays, that would be the, the best possible action uh, from, from my perspective, but uh, at the time, and, and at some point we, we like lost uh, interest and we didn't follow up on this. It was like, it's still in our, um, I think that the, the, the thing is still sold, um, but we, uh, if we went public with this, we would have to reevaluate does the problem still exist, and we, we were not willing to put time into this. But uh, there was an outcome um, which from today's perspective, um, I'm, I'm not happy with that one. Second case study. Uh, let's imagine uh, you, and this is a, a very typical type of engagements we have, that uh, large organizations bring us in like, okay, we plan to procure the following um, devices, whatever those might be, in this case, a uh, network security device. Uh, can you have a closer look on this uh, before we de deploy this? Uh, so, um, uh, there was a device and we stumbled across something which, um, uh, well, you could consider this a, a backdoor. Um, a backdoor which, looking closer, you might get an idea like, okay, there is a specific uh, actors behind this backdoor. So, uh, how to handle this one? Disclose this one. Uh, funnily enough, the, the question was brought up in the uh, uh, similar question was brought up in the in the earlier session. Um, let's take a, a structured approach, which I I, I, I propose. Um, at the first glance, okay, this might look like a vulnerability disclosure, which, looking closer, it is not, or maybe it is. That's uh, already an interesting question. Is a vulnerability? Uh, is a backdoor vulnerability from the um, uh, it depends on your perspective, actually. From the one who puts it in there, it's, it's not a vulnerability as it's a planned feature, kind of. From the ones not being aware of that, or from the non-five eyes countries, well, um, it might be considered a vulnerability, probably it is. A friend of mine who leads a threat intelligence uh, unit uh, in, a, in a German highly uh, specialized uh, shop, uh, he uses to say one country's white list is another country's black list. Uh, and there is uh, much truth in that. Um, what does this mean for handling this case? I mean, Germany is not a five-eyes country. So we are, it's, um, from a, the, the customer engagement, the, uh, the organization who made us look at the thing, uh, it's probably not what they want. So um, this brings up some interesting um, uh, questions, and there is what made the, the, the case, or this type of cases, much more uh, complicated than they might already be. Uh, then there is a thing, a whole different uh, or uh, alien in that moment type of value system is brought in as, say, um, confronting uh, the entities responsible for the backdoor. There would be immediately, well, we need this for uh, national security. This is needed to, be, to get hold of the bad guys uh, in Syria or wherever, um, which might be, might, might be true or not. It might also just be used for industrial espionage. Whatever. The thing is, there is a whole different um, value system brought into the discussion, uh, which, uh, by the way, applies as well. Um, uh, once there is, uh, there is a lot of, especially in the UK, a lot of reasoning of uh, measures, surveillance measures, which from uh, probably a perspective of many people in the room, we would consider unethical, but there's always like, oh, this is, this is meant to prevent a specific uh, uh, type of uh, crimes against children. And with that argument, you kill everything. Uh, which, um, I mean, I have three, three children myself. I'm, I'm not against uh, fighting uh, crimes against children. I just want to make you aware that this brings a whole uh, universe of, uh, say, questions to a technical uh, or technology ethics debate, and one has to be very, very clear and aware of uh, what this intermingling of these uh, value systems actually uh, produces. Uh, again, let's take a cl the structured approach. Who are the effective stakeholders? Then again, this is an interesting question. As um, from a very simple equation, 
we have a customer. Customer brought us in. Uh, so there is uh, our customer. Uh, there is, um, say, probably a stakeholder is the, the entity who put the backdoor in it. There might be, thinking about it, there might be other countries, which are not Five Eyes, which is, again, another group of stakeholders. Uh, this raises, um, and, and, and you might come up with the uh, uh, line of reasoning, well, uh, this is about internet security. If those devices are deployed in the internet, and the bad guys, con whoever the bad guys are, could compromise those, this is bad for everybody's uh, security in the internet. Uh, but, and this is why I asked uh, the, the question earlier when there was this, oh, uh, would you report um, if, uh, say, a nation state actor uh, compromised an, an, an NGO? The immediate answer of most of us would probably be yes. Uh, assuming, and I'm not judging anything here, I just want to make you aware of things. Assuming that the uh, majority of people here in the room are U.S. citizens, what if, well, uh, this is about a matter of national security for the U.S. Would your answer be the same? Uh, so we have a conflict, and this is a kind of classical conflict, and I call this a conflict of scope, where scope means, uh, okay, what is good for the, or bad for the Internet, maybe, might be different once you look at it from a more narrow perspective. Something that could be good for my country can be bad for the Internet as a whole, whoever that is. Uh, and uh, these types of uh, scoping and um, conflicts uh, based on scoping, um, we will face, we will see there is, uh, this occurs often. There is no easy solution to this, as to many questions. The thing just is, you have to be aware of this. You must sit down and, be, uh, as part of your reasoning and your decision-taking process, it's, um, just to make this clear, I'm, I'm not judging any type of outcome of your decision-taking process. I just want to help you uh, to have a structured decision-taking process. If, at that, if the end of that one comes out, well, I'm a U.S. citizen, or I'm a citizen, my, my, a German citizen, I'm a family father, whoever, and that's, uh, that's why I decide, uh, or I think the proper course of action is the following one. That's perf perfectly legitimate. You just have to be aware, well, maybe when I take this decision, it's different. Uh, it's uh, a, another a broader scope of stakeholders is affected uh, in a detrimental way, maybe. Um, so, and then uh, there is this thing, uh, what I mentioned, values. Talk about, from the principalism approach, talk about autonomy, talk about being beneficial, talk about justice. The, the autonomy angle, that's an interesting one for the back door. How does, uh, say, uh, having a back door or not disclosing it affect the autonomy of all the organizations which might be affected? Um, if, if uh, like by uh, uh, keeping your mouth uh, uh, closed, uh, you, uh, you foster the practice that uh, systems can be uh, compromised by uh, a nation state actor, um, which is maybe not in the interest of, uh, I don't know how many, uh, exactly how many countries uh, are there in the world, let's say 212 or so, minus five, uh, 207 countries uh, might be affected in a way that is different from those from, uh, from, from, from five countries, and 207 countries might be affected in a way that violates their aut autonomic uh, decision taking, like informed consent. Think about a main law. A report. There is the state. There's this thing. Uh, informed consent. What about informed consent uh, for the uh, for the people uh, who use this device, uh, which has a backdoor uh, built into it? So this uh, was a was a quite um, interesting one, and it serves as a nice example, or not so nice example, as a very uh, telling example why this principalism thing do not harm, be good to everybody, treat everybody. Uh, fairly and uh, uh, in an equal way and uh, respect the uh, autonomy of uh, human beings. All this is nice. I'm, I'm uh, pretty much everybody in the room is probably willing to, well, check, yes, that's good. But, uh, well, the world is more complex. You will see uh, conflicts and you will see dilemmata, which um, 
principalism uh, alone uh, can, can, can solve. And this is the, the main weak point of principalism. It's too broad, usually. Uh, it's good to, uh, say, reflect on things, but for actual decision-taking in actual situations, it uh, might not be too helpful. This is my experience. Uh, so you might ask, um, uh, obviously, uh, what we did. Uh, uh, well, this was a speculative case study. It didn't really happen. In, I, I can neither confirm nor deny that this thing ever happened. Uh, uh, so... Uh, I kind of uh, uh, skipped that one. Um, uh, I'm, in, I'm in, uh, in, in favor of uh, disclosing the thing. Uh, but if you do, uh, well, think about um, countries affected and, uh, well, get a good lawyer. That's what I would, uh, in, in that case, uh, suggest. But again, this was wholly speculative. Next one. Uh, the domain controller case study. Customer shows up, asks us, uh, um, like, okay, uh, uh, we, have a, we have a team um, which is uh, specialized in, in AD and Windows security, and, and they got a request from a customer, can you help us with analyzing the logs of a domain controller for specific, uh, say, uh, behavior? And we are like, sure, we, we, we could do this. Uh, there's this, uh, well, we, we have the expertise to do so. Uh, could you please uh, describe it in a bit more detail uh, what, uh, what you need from our side. Well, you know, we have that guy, Frank, uh, and Frank, uh, he's the leader of the local uh, activist uh, movement, and Frank, um, we think that Frank is leaking information. Well, okay, and uh, so what, to, and, and, and you, need to, you need to find out that Frank is le leaking information. And we were like, wait, wait a second, um, uh, this is not only a technical question. Uh, can you tell us a bit more? Yeah, hey, you guys must uh, help us uh, getting Frank sued. Uh, I mean, it was not that drastic, but thinking about it, the more questions that we asked, the more it was like, it became dubious. It became like, wait, wait, wait really, what, what, what do you want? What is, the, what is the, the objective of the activity you want us to, uh, to bring us in for? Um, this was uh, brought to the ethics committee uh, and uh, again, uh, say uh, a line of uh, the, the structured approach was kind of followed. Get effects. Well, that's not easy in that case. As, uh, well, it's, uh, it's okay. There's uh, there's logs, logs to look at. The customer couldn't really specify which type of activity to look for, uh, but uh, this could have been solved. In, in, in a technical way or another. But uh, it, uh, there were some, uh, some elements remained unclear, which didn't really help uh, like well-informed or ethical decision-taking. Uh, the, the next one is, um, well, look at the values affected. The result of the first one is always autonomy. You could ask, uh, well, what about Frank's autonomy uh, when we perform this activity? But the thing is, uh, Frank is, has, a, has a contract with the organization which by the nature of the contract, and this is uh, fully legitimate, there's laws and there's laws of uh, contracts and there's laws of, laws of work, uh, restrict his autonomy in, in, in some way. And um, so there's a, there's a frame which, which restricts that and you can't easily like surpass this based on ethical reasoning. Um, well, you could. There's a, there might be situations where law and ethics conflict uh, but uh, when those such situations occur, be very clear about your own agenda and uh, you should accept that laws are there for a reason and in most countries laws are based on common reasoning in some sense. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not against like civil obedience or anything of, the, of that, it's just um, life some, at times more complex than your personal perspective or Frank's personal perspective in that case. Um, beneficence, that again is an interesting one, as uh, say there's types of actions, you could, uh, we could do the job uh, or we can refrain from doing, doing the job, who's affected by this? Or uh, say if the activity is, um, uh, is performed, um, oh I only have three minutes left, then uh, I will um, uh, speed up a bit, <laughs> that is 
That is unfortunate. Um, can I get an extra five? Then I can manage. Thank you. Proctor? Yeah. Do you have eight minutes? Sure. Yes, you have eight the, minutes. Thank, thank you. Oh, I was, uh, I apologize then. Um, <laughs> Given I, have, I am giving this uh, the first time, um, uh, apparently I spent too much time with the, with the first part. The thing is, um, there is like human person versus organization, which again is um, when it comes to who benefits versus who, uh, who gets harmed, is a very common conflict. Uh, like uh, things that are good for an individual, for one human might not be good for the broader scope or vice versa. And uh, in general, humans tend to favor humans, which is the whole theme, uh, some of you know, might know this, uh, Casa de Papel. Uh, there's a group of humans which you have some favor for, uh, and they in some way in a specific kind of fight against or exploit a, a, a broader system. And this uh, serves as a perfect example of uh, make clear uh, who's affected, like uh, individual humans uh, as opposed to an organization. And in general, humans tend to favor humans, um, which is human, but one has to be aware of this. It might not lead to the right outcomes in, uh, uh, or to the, to the best possible from an ethical line of reasoning outcomes in specific situations. Uh, not in this one, uh, uh, I can... Um, uh, I can already uh, tell you what we did. The ethics committee declined, uh, uh, suggested declining the job, and the ethics committee, uh, it's, it's called recommendations, but those are uh, expected to be followed by everyone in the company, including management. Uh, so we didn't do the job. But uh, very quickly on this, um, say things that might be good for a smaller group, might not be good for a larger group. Uh, there is a whole thing on, uh, on, um, on internet scanning. And I can tell you on, on this one, it's, it's a kind of the same dilemma. There was people who argue like, well, we scan the internet for um, IoT devices and vulnerabilities, and that's good for everybody. So there is um, a group of people, uh, technically skilled, or from a, a specific, often, very often, make Caucasian vibe, what? And, and they decide on what's good for everybody out there you can probably already get the inherent problems. Um, I'm, two people uh, showing me five minutes. I, I got that. <laughs> I see you. Uh, I'm, losing, I, I'm losing time when I react on this. I won't further. I'll, I'll um, give you back 10 seconds to say this. I'll take the floor. You have five minutes, but that does give you time to at, get a couple of questions. And we have some other business. So I know. I will quickly go through this. You have five minutes, sir. Thank you. Um, this internet scanning usually violates the, pr the, the principle of autonomy. Have those people whose devices you scan, and you might uh, turn out light bulbs or whatever with that, giving you informed consent from the mainline report? Probably they have not. You can already uh, spot. Uh, I'm not a fan of this at all. At ENW, you have to. You have to. Uh, cross very high, uh, say, boundaries to get a project approved uh, which um, uh, does internet scanning in, in some way. And when I was in the, in the technically very sound uh, SATCOM talk yesterday at Black Hat, and they were like, oh, we did the scanning and we found devices uh, which at the time of the scanning were uh, 30,000 feet high, uh, VX Vox uh, shells. I was scratching my head, oh, wait, wait a second. Did you have informed consent of the people in the plane at the time? Uh, that you maybe crashed a 20-year-old version of VX Walks by scanning it from the ground? <laughs> Probably not. Uh, these uh, slides, will, these uh, slides will be published, uh, but uh, just to give you a quick idea, the scoping thing is important, and the scoping might be problematic. Very quickly, I already mentioned this, we declined the project. Uh, very quickly, two more case studies. Uh, this one was interesting as well. The, actually, it's, it's the first one on, on the time scale. Uh, so this led to the creation of the uh, ethics committee. We got a, uh, a request, uh, can you perform a training on telco technologies? And we have expertise on this, and we were like, yes. And then, next, uh, and while we were doing the setup phase, it was like, well, uh, can you do it in a way with uh, Russian, um, 
how do you call that uh, translation? In real time, Russian translation. And we were like, well, that's, maybe people will learn a bit less, but, well, if, if you pay us for this, we can do this. And then it turned out, oh, we only want to look a whole, a whole week at interception capabilities and, and surveillance um, interfaces. And that was why, okay, why, why do they want this? Uh, again, this brings up uh, many interesting questions. Who are the effective stakeholders? What is the scope? What, are, what, are we, what is about autonomy, informed consent? Again, we have this country versus other countries or versus the own population thing, and we don't even know. Uh, it, it might be perfectly legitimate, but it sounded uh, not so legitimate. Um, the thing is, uh, we did a job as we had already committed, but this led to the, to the creation of the Ethics Committee to relieve individuals. The guy who did it, he wasn't happy about this at all. We told him, hey, we have already committed, so do it. But uh, uh, and in the future, we will have a committee who, uh, which decides on this. I have another one. I can't um, tackle this one. It's an interesting one as well. You can probably get the main points from the slides, which really published. Conclusions. There's uh, a thing uh, I would like to, uh, to make uh, clear here. Oh. Uh, uh, that was a great slide. <laughs> this one. Conclusions. Understand that ethics affect a lot of things you do and understand there is uh, like these formal approaches and go through those. Get the facts, get the values, get the stakeholders, identify what could be done one way or another. This is not an easy task. And with this, uh, I will conclude. Um, uh, I already told you I'm, uh, I have a literature background. Uh, there is a whole genre of medieval uh, literature with uh, the, the court of artists and so. And they are usually the, 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 the hero, which in that case is pretty much always uh, male, which is I'm, I'm going to use he. The hero sets out to perform a quest. At some point, the hero has to decide right or left. And the first stage, Usually, pretty much always, the hero chooses right, as this is the easier way. The hero arrives at court. He might even win the, tourna the first tournament. He might even get the, uh, the, the, the king promises you can, uh, you can marry my daughter. Concept of autonomy is violated, but uh, <laughs> didn't so much exist at the time. But then, chaos kicks in, and he loses everything. He starts again at the same point, right or left, takes a left path. That's more tedious. That's more... Uh, it takes more time, more reflection, more work, but that's the one that leads you to, uh, to, the, to the grail. And this is uh, the message I want to give you when it comes to ethics. It takes time, it takes effort, but it's worth it. Thank you.